Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Henry, yeah, Dr. Bonnie Henry, I should say, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is our COVID-19 briefing for British Columbia for Thursday, August the 27th. We're very honored to be here on the territory of the Lekwungen-speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Tomorrow, Friday, we'll be providing a written briefing with case counts and other relevant materials at uh, around 3 o'clock. On Monday, we'll be back here at the Press Gallery Theatre in Victoria at 3 o'clock for our briefing. And with that, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, today, we uh, have 68 new uh, cases who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, including four which are epidemiologically linked. Uh, bringing our total in British Columbia to 5,372 people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. That includes 1,737 people in Vancouver Coastal Health, 2,818 in the Fraser Health Region, 173 people on Vancouver Island Health Region, 429 people in Interior Health, 137 people in the Northern Health Region, and 78 people who reside outside of Canada. We have 906 active cases around BC right now, of whom 22 are in hospital, seven of whom are in critical care or ICU. We unfortunately have one new death to report today, um, a person in long-term care, and that brings our total of people who have died from COVID-19 to 204. And our condolences go out to his family, uh, their family, their community, um, and their care team um, who looked after them. We have 2,810 people now who are under active daily follow-up with public health because they have been in close contact with somebody with COVID-19. And we have 4,253 people who have recovered. We have no new health care facility uh, outbreaks. Um, we have 11 active outbreaks right now in our health care system, uh, nine in long-term care or, or assisted living, and two in acute care units. Uh, our number of cases in our long-term care, assisted living or acute care are 714, including 432 residents and 282 staff. We have one uh, new community outbreak to report. Um, this uh, is an outbreak in the interior health uh, at a construction site for a water treatment facility near Elkford, BC. Um, and BC CDC and the Interior Health are, are investigating and monitoring this outbreak. There have been seven cases. Uh, the outbreak was identified after uh, workers had returned to their homes. Um, so uh, six of the seven cases reside in Alberta and one in another health authority in British Columbia. So uh, the coordination function across the country, we have contacts um, of the people who were affected um, in, at the facility in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan and Ontario. So a coordination meeting was held this morning and we will continue to coordinate across the country in managing this small outbreak. There's no risk to others in um, BC in and around Interior Health um, at this time. Health authorities also continue to issue community exposure alerts, as we know, for a number of locations, as well as for flights coming in and out of British Columbia where cases of uh, COVID-19 have been identified. So please check with those health authority website and follow the guidance that is on those websites. And that will tell you whether you need to self-isolate and monitor or whether uh, monitoring for symptoms is all that's needed, depending on the level of risk um, with that exposure. So there's a couple of things I want to report on today. One, if we could get uh, uh, the map put up. So today we are providing um, some local health area information around COVID-19. From the very beginning, we have been committed to providing as much information as we're able to around where people with COVID-19 have been here in British Columbia. Early on, as you know, we report it by health authority only because of the risk of identification of an individual with small numbers. As we had more cases here in BC, we were able to provide data to communities and to the public um, by what we call health service delivery areas. So 
though smaller geographic area. We are now at the point where we have um, sufficient data um, over time that we can even um, go more granular than that. And this is what we call the lo he local health area map of COVID-19 cases. So this map will be updated on a periodic basis, basis depending on new cases um, so that we are able to maintain people's confidentiality. So as you can see from this, the map tells us things that we know, that virtually every part of our province has been touched by COVID-19. Communities large and small and geographically dispersed. But despite this spread, we must continue to find our balance and understand how we can continue to live with COVID-19 over the coming months. What it also reflects is the diagnosed cases. So these are the cases who were tested or were epidemiologically linked to COVID-19. And we know that there are additional people who were infected with COVID-19, particularly in the period of March and April um, when we uh, had limited testing and we knew that there were people coming from other places, for example, where they may have been exposed. So this um, reflects that as well. It doesn't reflect what we know now that the contacts of people who have COVID-19. And uh, right now we're monitoring over uh, close to 3,000 people. And so this is a reflection of only the cases. So this means that restarting our activities once again and at the same time protecting our most vulnerable and doing our best to keep ourselves and those around us safe is something we must all continue to do. The other um, information I want to pass on today is that uh, we will be reporting for the first time a number of suspect cases of what we've called MISC. And so that is uh, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children and adolescents. And uh, this is something that has arisen as being associated in some parts of the world with COVID-19. We've talked about this in the past. And we made this a reportable condition um, so that we could monitor it here in British Columbia. And now uh, we are reporting our first cases of suspect MISC um, because the case definitions have changed across Canada. Previously, what we're reporting is only confirmed cases. And confirmed cases means you have a laboratory test or you've been a contact of somebody with COVID-19. In our case here in British Columbia, all eight cases are suspect because they did not test positive for COVID-19 virus. They didn't have antibodies either, and they had no known exposures to COVID-19 cases. So we have no confirmed cases here in BC, but we are now with the change in, uh, in, in uh, case definitions, we'll be reporting eight suspect cases in British Columbia. As we know, MISC is a, a very similar to a, a rare childhood condition that's known as Kawasaki disease. And we have seen children with that condition here in British Columbia every year. And for, fortunately, most patients with either condition recover completely. And that is the case with the eight people here in British Columbia. They have all been reported by BC Children's Hospital. Five are male, three are female. The, average, uh, the median age was four years of age. Um, and all were hospitalized. Two children were admitted to intensive care, but all have fully recovered. Um, these are serious illnesses, as we know, but this is a reflection of the fact that our system works. We have been monitoring this across BC, and we will continue to monitor it, particularly as we move into the coming months with things like school opening. The so this is, uh, this is uh, important information for us to continue to follow and we will be doing that in the coming months. As we have learned and as we continue to learn, COVID-19 requires new ways of doing things, new ways of living our lives, new ways of precautions, taking precautions, new routines for ourselves and our families, whether at home, at work, at school, or spending time with our friends and family. But what remains the same across BC is our commitment to continuing to learn and to adapt our approach. This is in addition to doing all we can to protect our communities, particularly our seniors and our elders and those we care for most. So let's keep doing that. Let's keep doing our best, using the information that we collect 
every day as we're moving through this crisis together. And let's continue to be kind, to be calm, and to be safe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. I wanted to, uh, you know, on behalf of the Premier and on behalf of the government and people in BC, to pass on uh, my condolences to the family of the person who passed away in Fraser Health in long term care from COVID 19 uh, in the last 24 hours. Uh, as we say, but it's important to remember uh, each time someone passes away the significance of that loss to their family, to their communities, to the people who have been taking care of them. It's a significant and, uh, and, uh, and remarkable and difficult loss at a time when our ability to grieve together is limited. And so we wanted to pass on our condolences to the family uh, involved and to the 203 other families who have lost their loved ones from COVID-19. I also want to take the opportunity to express uh, um, uh, my condolences to the families of the 175 people who uh, passed away in July as a result of uh, overdose death in our province. Their loss is with us very much as well as is as are both public health emergencies and I want everybody in the province and I know I speak for everyone in the province when I say we grieve for their loss uh, in uh, from overdose death losses that we continue to feel are surely unnecessary losses that we have to do everything we can to reduce uh, with everything we can in the coming days and weeks and months ahead. Uh, a note that we have 22 people hospitalized in BC from COVID-19 today. That's up one from yesterday and 19 of those are in Fraser Health. The other three are being taken care of in Vancouver Coastal Health. I wanted to express again uh, my admiration for uh, Dr. Henry's team in public health, our health authority teams in health in public health, our medical health officers across BC. As Dr. Henry has noted, 2,810 people uh, under surveillance who are self-isolating in the province because of contacts with COVID-19, 906 active cases. And in the last two days, um, in Wednesday's report, 4,409 tests completed, 4,582 yesterday, which I believe is uh, a high or near a high uh, for British Columbia. So that's essentially 9,000 tests, 8,991 tests over two days, and of course 130 tests positive, a, t a test positive rate which is lower than before, but it's important um, not to draw conclusions from one day's uh, testing. Um, I wanted to uh, also appreciate uh, the work of people in public health in supporting infection control and protection in long-term care. We now have, as the outbreak is over, at our Butis Care Center uh, 11 uh, either care homes or acute care hospitals or independent living um, uh, homes in BC uh, with uh, active outbreaks for COVID-19 and the work being done there is both extraordinary and difficult and challenging and really uh, everybody involved from the residents to the families to the care providers to the people in public health providing support is doing everything they can to ensure and to support people as they go through those, the difficult challenges relating to outbreak. Every Thursday I provide an update on our surgical renewal plan. As you know, on May 7th, the Premier released our commitment to surgical renewal in BC to allow us uh, to keep up with new demands for surgeries and complete the surgeries lost due to COVID-19. On May 18th, we, res we resumed non-urgent scheduled surgeries. On July 21st, we released our first monthly report. And uh, in the coming uh, few days, we'll be releasing our second monthly report. Across all fronts, the progress continues. This is our 17th weekly update on our surgical renewal commitment. The number of patients contacted about their surgery has increased to 85,345. Between May 18th and August 23rd, we completed 84,266 surgeries, 64,370 were scheduled surgeries, and 19,896 were unscheduled or emergency surgeries. That's 15,870 in Interior Health, 23,592 in Fraser Health, 19,213 in Vancouver Coastal Health, 
17,188 in Vancouver Island Health, 4,883 in Northern Health, and 3,520 in the Provincial Health Services Authority. Last week, we reported 6,132 surgeries completed in the period from August 10th to August 16th. Health authorities have verified their data, and the total number of surgeries completed for that period, that's August 10th to 16th, is now up to 6,382. And put that in context, that's 373 more surgeries than the same period last year. This week, well, we completed 6,062 surgeries, and that number is likely to rise as it every week as we adjust, uh, as we uh, verify all of the data. But 6,062 surgeries for this past week, the week uh, ending August 23rd. Our healthcare system is called upon to respond in many situations. This week, Penticton Re Regional Hospital and the IHA took proactive measures to prepare for a potential evacuation alert due to the Mount, Mount Christie wildfire. This resulted in some uh, more complex surgeries requiring an overnight stay to be rescheduled. Fortunately, as you know, the evacuation was not required. Also, as we reported yesterday, there's a COVID-19 outbreak at Langley Memorial Hospital in Fraser Health. I re can report that to date, surgeries continue at this site. This, the clinical protocols put in place are there to ensure patient and provider safety. These two events remind us that the surgical renewal commitment remains highly vulnerable to external forces. However, our determination remains to ensure patients get the surgeries they need. A key part of the surgical renewal commitment is to have in place and train 400 additional operating room nurses. I can now report that all health authorities have submitted their training plans to the ministry who is working with them to support this massive training enhancement. I again want to express my appreciation to everybody who is delivering on the surgical renewal commitment and our, and our uh, commitment to patients. Um, uh, there were some questions on Monday with respect to Island Health and the increase in call volumes to the COVID-19 call center. Uh, just to put it in context to say what the volumes um, are um, for the week ending uh, August 9th, the average volume was 438. The week ending August 16th, the call volume was up to 690.83. Uh, the week ending August 23rd, the call average volume was 543.1. This week, the numbers are down from that, 346 on August 24th, 351 on August 25th, and 372 on August 26th. Um, uh, in response to this, Island Health is actively recruiting staff, extending offers, uh, I, as I understand it, to, uh, to 45 individuals, and recruitment continues. This week, uh, Island Health have more than doubled the number of nurses answering calls, and we'll have more nurses and registration clerks starting tomorrow. Uh, we're expecting to have more staff fully in place in the coming weeks. And the call abandonment rate uh, dropped from a high, and this was unfortunate, of 70% on August 17th to 7% on August the 26th. In closing, we had uh, we head into another weekend uh, of this uh, summer where we're dealing with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, with progress on surgical renewal reported and continuing to show uh, remarkable achievement, with visitation to our loved ones in long-term care and assisted living providing some comfort and much needed to support to many of us and our families, and with indeed back to school on the near horizon for so many others, our mission, our duty, is to stop the spread. Uh, as we've experienced these past few weeks, we're more comfortable, more at ease, uh, more reassured when we're acting to keep COVID-19 at bay than when we're looking to detection and rapid response to compensate for not following the guidance that uh, Dr. Henry and public health officials have provided in stopping the spread. Earlier on, we showed that ours was the lead to follow in bending the curve, not the rules, in being 100% all in and stopping the spread. What we all should know is that ours can be, again, be the lead to follow. What we all must know is that we can again demonstrate that our skills at prevention and our commitment to stopping the spread are getting our 100% effort. We must each use uh, uh, the skills that our public health leaders have taught us to stop the spread, and we must use these skills consistently because physical distancing saves lives, because respecting engineering and administrative safeguards saves lives, because wearing a mask, when we're, whether when we're asked to or required to or a lack of distancing makes it right to, saves lives. This weekend and always, prevention remains our goal. Stopping the spread remains our duty, and consistently using the skills we've been taught remains our direct path to both. 
Uh, I, just a few words in French to finish. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons 68 nouveaux cas qui ont testé positif pour COVID-19 pour un total de 5372 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Nous sommes attristés d'annoncer un nouveau décès lié au COVID-19 dans la régie de santé de Fraser pour un total de 204 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous offrons nos condoléances à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches pendant cette pandémie. Chaque régie de santé compte des patients atteints de COVID-19, bien entendu. 1 737 se trouvent à Vancouver Coastal, 2 818 à Fraser. Uh, 173 sur l'île de Vancouver, 429 dans l'intérieur et 137 au nord. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 22 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dans 7 en soins intensifs. Uh, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to reporters on the phone, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You're limited to one question and one follow-up. Please take your phones off mute. You will not be audible until your name is called. First question is from Hina Alam, Canadian Press. Hi, hi Dr. Henry. I hope you're doing okay. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me what the level of herd immunity uh, reached here in BC is and how helpful is it? I mean, um, uh, do you trust it? Is there such a thing? And also, what are the number of recovered cases today, ma'am? Okay, so the number of recovered cases, let's st start with that, is 4,253. You, you will note that it doesn't add up exactly to the number of cases minus the people who have died. Um, because there are a few cases, I think we're up to nine now, of people who what we call lost a follow-up. Most of those are people who have lived elsewhere and have moved back to either their home country or their home province. Um, so we don't know um, whether they're recovered, but from the timing perspective, they, they have been. Um, and the first question was around the level of immunity in the province. So one of the things that we've done to try and assess that, and we reported on this a few weeks ago, was looking at uh, the serology testing, so testing for antibodies in a random sample of, of people who had um, d uh, had blood taken for a different reason from our community labs. And what we show is that we have a very low level of immunity in the province, or at least people who have antibodies to uh, COVID-19. It's about 1 to 1.5 percent uh, around the province. So that is, uh, like we've seen around the world, um, there, even in the very hardest hit areas around the world, the percentage of people who have uh, antibodies to COVID remain quite low. Um, the, t the type of methodology that we used here in BC, there's uh, several similar studies that were done uh, in the United States that found very similar types of uh, levels of immunity across the province. The challenge that we have still, though, is we don't know for sure what antibodies actually mean. Does it mean that we have long-lasting immunity? Do we have to have a certain level of antibodies um, to be protected from reinfection? And we've seen some cases, some anecdotal cases of people maybe being reinfected um, with a slightly different strain of, of the virus. We're, uh, we have a national immunity task force that is working uh, across Canada but also uh, globally to try and answer those questions. Um, but we do know that we probably have some protection for a period of time after we've been infected with COVID-19 uh, and that the number of people who have been affected in our province is still quite low. Do you have a follow-up, Hina? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering what the, uh, what the kind of mutation of the virus is in BC right now, because uh, some of the other parts of the world are reporting that the virus has mutated quite a bit. Um, and uh, is it the same as it was when it started out six or seven months ago? Uh, how worried are you about it? And also, uh, what are some of the studies that are being done here in BC on the virus? Thank you, Dr. Sure. So in terms of, uh, of the immunity, one of the things that we're doing are the genomic sequencing. We're doing whole genome sequencing, we call it. So we look at all of the RNA 
um, of the, the virus. And we have a, a project that's being led by the BC CDC and Genome BC um, to look at the progression of the viruses across BC. So every sample that we get where we isolate the virus or the RNA, we um, sequence it, it's called, um, to get an understanding of whether it has changed and to help us understand where the virus has come from. And it, we presented some of that data a few months ago, which showed that our initial introductions, we had some introductions from China, from Iran, and then from uh, Washington State and Eastern Europe and, and other parts of Canada. So we continued to do that. We have seen some changes, and um, that's how we can tell if people have gotten the virus from different places. But we have not seen, and around the world this, this holds true, we've not seen major changes in the virus. It doesn't change as fast as some of the other respiratory viruses that we know about, like influenza, for example, which changes very rapidly, even within a few months. And that means that your immunity may not be as well. So there's, there, following those studies, quite closely as we are. Um, we, we have been watching for that. There was one study that you maybe have uh, seen that came out of Singapore, which showed that there was a particular m mutation which may mean that the virus causes less severe disease. So we're obviously watching that one very closely too and seeing if that mutation is found in any of the viruses that have been circulating here in BC or across Canada. So there are quite a few studies being done. Um, there's a list of many of them on, on the BC CDC website, as well as uh, Michael Smith Foundation, and um, there's too many to, to list, but uh, in terms of whole genome sequencing and monitoring the virus over time, that's one that we're very involved with here in BC and have been working on, and also connecting with uh, our colleagues across the country on that one too. Next, next question is from Kelly Grant, Global Mail. Uh, hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, seeing as how you, you pointed out with these new maps that the BC CDC is releasing today, that as we know, there are some parts of the province that are seeing higher levels of community transmission and some that are seeing a lot lower. As you get ready for schools to open, are you recommending that any extra resources or different policies or caps on class sizes be put into place in any of these areas with higher community transmission? Yeah, so what we look at, and I think the map is a good example of that, it, how our convention is, is to uh, report cases by their place of residence. So it doesn't necessarily reflect where they have picked up the virus, where they've been exposed. So many of these cases were related to travel. We still get travel-related cases. Um, and many of the cases may be that you worked in one place and live in another place. Having said that, across the province, our rates of prevalence of the virus, so the, the number of people who are positive per thousand population, are very low and we relative to any other jurisdiction in the world. As well, our rates of new cases, our incidence of numbers of, of cases per 100,000 population are also very low. And uh, there have been some standards that have been put out by other organizations, and those are things that we're watching. We watch, you know, how much virus is circulating in our community, how much of it is known, where we know the exposures, we know the risks, we've identified somebody and they become ill when they've been um, uh, in uh, isolation or quarantine so that they're not passing it on to others. And that remains very high. So we still are finding people quickly, we are linking people quickly. Less than 20% of our cases are, are unlinked. And those are the ones that, that talk to, uh, to us about you know, community spread that we're not aware of. And we investigate those very carefully. So all of those markers everywhere in our province are very low and we will continue to watch them. So what that means is that the, the parameters that we've put in place um, from a public health perspective in schools across this province are, are still um, valid and they're the ones that will work no matter what we're seeing and we will continue to watch the community spread and take whatever measures we need to ensure that, uh, that schools and workplaces and our communities are protected. I think the other really important thing as we're moving into to September and schools going back is that what happens in schools, and we've seen this around the world, what happens in schools reflects what's happening in the community. 
So we have low, very low level of, of spread or no spread in mo most communities here in BC. And even in those communities where we have some community connections and spread, it's still at a very low level. And we expect to see that in our schools. Um, and this is a very challenging time, and we in public health will be there with every school in this province to make sure that we have a response, that we identify um, children or adults in the school setting early, and that we have the things in place that we need to make sure that we're doing everything to prevent transmission. Do you have a follow-up, Kelly? I do. Um, I know you've spoken before about the, the sort of dry run that BC did in June and, and how well that went. Um, even though prevalence and incidence is still quite low compared to other parts of the world, it is quite a bit higher than it was in BC in June, if I, if I understand right. So are you still feeling as confident that that, that, that June experiment um, is a sort of useful predictor of what will happen now that there are more cases than there were then? You know, I think there's a couple of things from that. We learned um, really practical operational things, what works, what doesn't work, about how to do things in the school system. And, and my hat goes off to uh, the, the teachers, the educators, the principals, the parents in every school in this province who have been taking that information, looking at their own school and coming up with the plans that will make it work. That, and if we look around the world, there's millions of children who are going back to school. Scotland went back last week. We've been watching what's happening in places like Denmark and Finland. We've been watching Germany. Um, so yes, we do think that we have what's in place now to do this safely and that we'll be there and they'll be uh, I, you know, there's very likely there's going to be cases because we have a low level of transmission. So how do we make sure that we're doing everything we can to minimize that and that we're managing them quickly and efficiently? And we've, we've shown that we can do that because this is a long-term thing. We are living with this virus for a long time. So we need to work together. We need to use our innovation and our imagination, and we need to work uh, with, with kids and with the adults in our schools. And we will do that, and we'll get through this, and we will be able to manage it. And I think that's one of the things that we learned from June. That you know We've had introductions into the school with people who had COVID, and we were able to manage it, and we managed it quickly and efficiently without transmissions. Next question is from Binder Sudgeon, CTV. Hi, Dr. Henry. That sort of touches on the question I wanted to ask you. Is that We're hearing from parents who are saying they would just feel a lot better going back to school if it was two weeks after that long weekend period, because they're worried that people might be going away in the summer, they might be you know, opening up their bubble slightly or going to places, and so they're just saying if we could push the school start date back two weeks, that that would make them feel better. Is that something that was considered? And, and what do you think of that idea? Yeah, you know, I don't think there's any perfect time. Whether we push it out two weeks, that's just going to give some people more anxiety for longer. Um, you know what? We have good, solid plans in place. Um, people are starting now to prepare we're going back to school. We've given them notice about that. Now's the time where we have to start thinking about those, those routines that are going to make it work for our families, for our school community, for our children. You know, we need to not prolong the anxiety. We need to get uh, kids used to the thought about, oh yeah, I'm going back to school, but no, I can't hug my friends this year. It's going to be a new school this year. And in the first couple weeks of that, we'll be all of us learning that. The learners, the teachers, um, the, the administrative staff in our schools, parents about how we take our child in, let them uh, drop them off. Those are all of the things that are going to happen in the first couple of days and weeks of the school. So those are the things that we're going to get started with um, in a couple of weeks. And it's going to be it's going to be okay. We're going to work through this, and uh, it's important for the new school, the look and the feel, for us all to get used to it. And whether we, st I think, I don't think there's any value in postponing that. Do you have a follow up, Binder? I'm okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Dr. Henry, thanks for taking my question. I was hoping that you could elaborate more on the MISC situation, because there are people that are very concerned about what that might have, and I know a lot of people don't know much about it. So could you explain again what the eight suspected cases mean 
um, as far as, you know, we don't want to alarm people, I think, is, is just try to explain what what impact that has on people in British Columbia if they're worried that their kids might come down with something like this. I think it's almost exactly the opposite, but thank you for bringing that up. I just, you know, I, I want people to know that we have been monitoring this. Um, I think early on I reported that we had had six cases. We've been monitoring this since March, since it was first um, identified. It's one of the things that uh, is really important for us to, to see if we're seeing similar things to what's been reported in other parts of the world. And I think it is reassuring that we have had eight cases that have been reported. They've all been investigated. None of them have been confirmed. So that is also a reflection of the fact that we have low transmission rates in, in our population, even though we now have several hundred young people who have been affected by COVID. So in this case, we had eight who have been reported. Um, they've all been admitted to hospital at Children's Hospital. All of them have recovered. A couple of them did require ICU care. And, and you know that's what's important about this. It's, it is a, a disorder that causes widespread inflammation. But there are other causes of it. And I think that's important too, that people know that we're watching for this. We're being careful about it. People are being cared for, and we are testing and making sure and, and looking for COVID. In the, the cases that we've had in BC, all of them are, meet what's called a suspect case definition. And the reason I'm bringing it up today is because we, we will be reporting it to the public health agency to be part of the, the global data on this uh, condition and trying to understand it better. Um, but none of the cases here in BC have been related to COVID. So that's important as well. And we'll continue to monitor this really carefully. Do you have a follow up, Marcella? I do. And it is again about education because Abinder touched on this a bit, but we're still hearing from people that are worried about schools not being safe and keeping COVID out depends on trusting everyone going in is actually following your guidelines and orders. And we've seen plenty of examples in British Columbia where people just don't believe the rules apply to them. So how concerned are you about a possible super spreader outbreak like we have seen at schools in the United States? Yeah, you know, here in, in BC, these plans that have been made um, have been developed with widespread input at the local level. So they're the things that are going to work for each school. And that's what parents are now getting used to because they're starting to, to see the details of what it's going to mean for their child in their school. But schools are a very controlled situation. And I also think what we have in BC, and I mentioned it uh, earlier, you know, it, it, what we see in some jurisdictions is a reflection of what's going on in the community. We have very low transmission in our community. We have low prevalence of disease. We have people who know what to do. And it's going to be an adjustment as we go into the school setting. So no, I don't expect to see widespread outbreaks in our school like we've seen in some places. I expect that there may be cases now and then, and we'll be there to monitor them, to, to help people through it, to work with each school community, and to make sure they get the notification they need, they get the testing if it's, if it's needed. But we also have to remember that schools also are, I mean, that time of year, we also see many other things that can cause respiratory illness. And we will continue to monitor for all of those respiratory illnesses and take the, the, the actions that we need. So I, you know, these plans are in addition to what we do every year, and they are well thought out with each community in mind. Next question is from Nick Johansson, Castanet News. Hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, with regards to the outbreak in Elkford, um, can you provide a, a timeline of when these workers left the town and, and when the cases were first identified? And do you have the number of workers who were at the site that, uh, that may have been exposed? Uh, I don't have the total number of workers who may have been exposed. I, um, I do know that there were seven who tested positive. It was uh, uh, after they had returned home. There's a rotation that happens every two weeks, as I understand it. Um, I know there's more information that will be coming out from Interior Health. We were made aware of the cases uh, uh, earlier this week um, and traced back uh, the cases, uh, the six uh, in Alberta, the one here in British Columbia, and working uh, with Tech, who who runs the uh, uh, the construction site 
has been very forthcoming. We have the contact information for all of those who were in the areas that they might have been exposed and we're working across the province. So as just this morning they had a coordination call with the other um, provinces where there were people who were in contact. So all of the contacts as far as I'm aware have been notified within the last day or so. Nick, do you have a follow-up? I do, thank you. Um, obviously, Elkford being a small town with limited uh, medical facilities there, uh, how are you able to ensure residents there that there was no uh, spread in the community? Were these people separated in a, in a separate camp? Yes, it, it is not in the community. It was separate from the community. And as you're aware, we have industrial camp regulations that have been adjusted for COVID-19. So those were being followed on the site, as far as I'm aware. Um, and, and Interior Health was uh, um, has confirmed that there's no risk to the public, that there has not been exposures that we're aware of in the public. So those COVID-19 safety plans that we have put in place in those industrial camp areas and uh, construction sites like this one um, are designed to do just that, to protect the community and to protect the people who are working in that site. Next question is from Mary Brooks, Island Social Trust. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Um, for parents and caregivers listening out there, what do the symptoms of MISC look like in children, the ones that you've seen in BC? And you're saying that it, it's not, they haven't tested positive for COVID. Um, and you say there's no incidence of exposure. So why have they been, be, why have they become suspect cases? Yeah, so early on um, when this was identified in, in other communities uh, around the world, we uh, went back and it was called a Kawasaki-like syndrome. So Kawasaki syndrome is something we've known for quite a long time. We still don't know what causes it. Um, it has been associated with other infections, including uh, uh, gastrointestinal infections like uh, um, uh, Campylobacter infections and other respiratory infections, but it tends to happen later. So you recover from the whatever causes you to be sick, and then you develop this response, inflammatory response. So common symptoms are things like fever, uh, that lasts a prolonged fever, it lasts for many days, red eyes, skin rash, um, belly pain, abdominal pain, uh, vomiting or diarrhea, and, and feeling wiped out and tired, very tired. But it tends to be a constellation of things. And for some uh, children, it can uh, spread to causing an inflammation of the blood vessels. And part of that can be a rash or red eyes, but part of it can also affect the blood vessels of the heart. Um, and those are the, the common things that we see. So prolonged fever after an infection um, and any of these other um, signs that happen that uh, particularly a child's very lethargic, um, low energy, they should seek medical um, assessment for sure, for medical attention. It is, I must say, a rare condition. You know, for all of the children that we've seen around the world that have had COVID, there are still very small numbers of this associated with that um, for many other infections that we see. And we've gone back and looked, you know, how many cases of Kawasaki syndrome do we see in BC on an average year? And we've not seen an increase in that. So this is something that happens. It happens uh, uh, caused by other infections and other reasons that we were not entirely sure of. Um, and the reason that uh, we're talking about it now is because we were only reporting confirmed cases, which means you, you had a, either a serology test, so antibodies to COVID, you had a positive COVID test um, because you were sick or you were exposed to somebody with COVID. And we had no, we had no confirmed cases here in BC, but the uh, WHO has broadened the, uh, the case definition so that we can get a better understanding of the syndrome itself and uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada and, and we've agreed in Canada to report these suspected cases as well so we get a better understanding of the condition. So that's why we're, um, I'm letting you know now because we'll be reporting it and that will be public information over the coming days. Do you have a follow-up, Mary? Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you. Um, for the children who ended up in ICU due to MISC or suspected MISC, what was the type of care? Was it for cardiovascular inflammation specifically and around the heart, or did it, and did it involve being on a ventilator like people who do have actual COVID? Um, so 
uh, all of the, the eight cases were all hospitalized. Two uh, were admitted to intensive care. Um, they have all fully recovered, but yes, they were admitted because of concerns around inflammation of the heart and the blood vessels and shock like syndrome. Um, I, I don't know if they were ventilated or not, um, but I do know that all have, have recovered. Next question is from Glenn Korstrom, Business in Vancouver. Glenn, are you uh, there? Moving on. Uh, Shannon Waters, BC Today. Hello. I'm wondering um, why the change with reporting on health service delivery areas. A few months back, we were told that you know, reporting on this kind of information could be stigmatizing. It could give people a false sense of security about their own community. And I'm just wondering um, what prompted the shift. Yeah. So as we said from the very beginning, we want to give as much information as we can to everybody so they know about uh, cases without compromising people's confidentiality. And, and we've talked about this many, many times over the last few months. So early on, um, we gave broader geographic areas because there were such small numbers that people would identify if we knew that somebody had traveled to a certain area or come back from um, uh, uh, a cruise ship, for example, they could be identified. Once we had enough people, um, so there's many other things that we look at. We look at the population in that area. We look at um, uh, how many people are male or female and what level of information we're providing about individuals. So as we accumulated enough cases in the health service delivery areas, we released that information a few months ago as, as to give people a better indication of where geographic areas were being most affected. And we're now at the point where we have sufficient numbers of cases by a smaller geographic area. So it does give you a sense of where people who have been affected with COVID or have been diagnosed with COVID live. It doesn't tell the whole story, of course, and that's why we need to put the picture together with our understanding of the outbreaks that were happening. Um, you know that the clusters of cases, I mean, it, it clearly has been mostly focused in the Lower Mainland, and we know that a large numbers of cases are related to things like the Mission um, Correctional Facility, to uh, clusters and outbreaks in long-term care homes, to some of the um, uh, food processing plants where we had large numbers of cases. So it is one piece of information that can help people at a community level. I do say, again, it doesn't tell the whole story because, as I mentioned, it doesn't talk about the people who didn't have a test at the one time, but it also doesn't reflect necessarily where somebody was exposed to COVID. And it doesn't reflect those people who have been in quarantine all over the province because they've been exposed in one place or another. So. It is an important piece of information for people. Do you have a follow-up, Shannon? I do. Um, also on exposures, you know, where people are being exposed to the virus, does the province have a sense at this point in time? You know, we talk a lot about these events, um, you know, that are problematic or ill-advised, but we've also had a number of outbreaks um, and exposure events linked to workplaces. I previously asked the health ministry if they can provide even a rough um, sort of estimation or rough figures of how many people acquired infections at work versus how many people, you know, were out at a party when they were exposed. And I'm wondering, Dr. Henry, if you uh, have any information on that front at this point. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it's complicated. We ask those questions all the time, and uh, I do have a rough breakdown, and it, it varies, and it varies over time, and it varies by by health authority. So, for about a third of the cases that we're seeing now uh, are related to uh, events like parties, like uh, um, you know some of the exposure events at uh, clubs and nightclubs that we've seen. And about a third are related to transmission within families and and community groups. And uh, so sometimes it's a mixture of both. So somebody may be um, 
at, at work and been with a co-worker and then brought it home to their family and transmission in families. And then about a third are related to some of the other uh, exposure events, like you say, like a, a workplace cluster, for example, or uh, outbreaks in, in long-term care homes. I think the important thing for us, though, when we look at this is when we identify a case, when somebody tests positive and public health is talking to them, can we link them to a known exposure event? And that's something that we take very seriously because it's those unlinked cases that we are most concerned about. Um, I should say that a proportion about 20% uh, of our cases overall, a little bit less now, but uh, are related to, to travel, so international travel um, and travel to other provinces as well. So it, it breaks down a little bit like that, but it varies over time depending on what's happening. We have time for one more question. As a reminder, our next media availability will be on Monday afternoon. For everyone listening and watching, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a joint statement later this afternoon with the latest information on cases, hospitalizations, and outbreaks. It will also have a link to today's map that Dr. Henry has referred to. For medical guidance on protecting families and communities and for access to provincial guidance on COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. And for information about the province's pandemic supports, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question is from Glenn Kors from Business in Vancouver. Hello, can you hear me now? <laughs> you know, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. We can hear you. Hello. <laughs> Okay, good. Um, I think it was on mute somehow. Um, just for some clarity on, on the seniors' homes, yesterday there were 10 that, that had active outbreaks. Today there's nine. You didn't say which one is officially over, so I'm just wondering which one is over. The, the one that's over is... Uh, is uh, I believe it was Arbutus. It's Arbutus, yeah. Arbutus and Vancouver Coastal. Arbutus okay. uh, Care Home in Vancouver Coastal. Okay, and, and then the, the uh, acute care facility is at Langley Memorial Hospital, and it is still Queen's Park Care Centre, right? Correct. Excellent. All right, thank you very much.